please. This is the Village of Riverside Board of Trustees regular meeting for Thursday, June 16, 2016. The time is 7 p.m. Please call the roll. Here. Trustee Collins. Here. Trustee Lumsden. Here. Trustee Pollard. Here. Trustee Sutter. Here. Village Manager Francis. Here. Village Attorney Molina. Here. Also present, Village Clerk Haley. Not with us this evening, Trustees Ballerine and Hamilton. We have a forum. Could you please join us for the board? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you and good evening to everyone who's here and everybody watching at home. Uh, if you are here with us tonight and you'd like to make a public comment to the board, you can do so either during the public comment period or any time during the meeting. I just ask that you be recognized by the president and you make your comments from the podium so folks at home can hear and see what you have to say. So first up this evening uh, is public comment. Would anyone like to address the board? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bill Milliker, and I'm a, a neighbor of yours here at 180 Lawton in Riverside. Uh, I submitted an appeal to the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, at the last meeting, and that appeal didn't proceed because it came to a two-to-two tie, and the, uh, the board couldn't come to a decision. And so I'm bringing this to the Village Board to see if there's any additional steps or decisions that you can take. Uh, is it possible for me to pass something out? Of course. So I, uh, I submitted a proposal for a new porch, and really it's because the existing one is small and in disrepair. And my neighbor built a, one of those big wide houses next to me, and it has one of those big porches you can sit on. And I looked at that and I thought, you know, it would be nice to kind of sit on the porches. I think that's what Olmstead intended with Riverside. So I wanted to, to put in a, a, a bigger porch there. It's great to have one. And I worked with three different architects to try and come up with something that would be a a good fit before I just found one that really fit the, the look of the look of the home. And really, I was told by one of them, this was a rivers, artist, uh, a, uh, an architect who works in Riverside, uh, that I could expand the porch because of the setback defined by the village. And he looked up the ordinance, looked up the setback maps, and so, uh, but what I wanted to do was kind of build one to the right scale of the house. So I spent, you know, a few thousand dollars already uh, for iterations, expertise, drawing, permits, and it's part of a, a new landscape and repair of the facade. So uh, the permit itself was denied because the porch is larger than the existing footprint. The new one is about one foot wider on each side, a foot and a half deeper. Kind of only comes out about eight more inches, um, but it's enough. And uh, when I brought it to the Planning and Zoning Committee, there really was a recognition that there are two different valid interpretations of the zoning ordinance. It comes down to the WPA maps, right? The WPA maps were maintained in Riverside from 1940 to 1967, and they show the setback of each house in Riverside. And really, the ordinance can be interpreted in one of two ways. First, uh, the maps as they exist specify the setback. And then secondly, where the maps are not considered accurate or, or there's other, some other problem, then the front of the house is the setback. So the planning and zoning was tied to two, could not really agree on which interpretation was valid. And over the next few meetings, they're going to consider how to clarify the order of this interpretation. Uh, but two of the commissioners voted in favor of my appeal and they made the following points during the review. First you know, there is a discrepancy in the ordinance, and they could decide in favor of the homeowner. Uh, secondly, this time it is possible for the committee to do something positive for one of the residents, and then, then make changes to the WPA to limit further changes. And then after the meeting, I did get a suggestion from one of the commissioners to bring this to the village board for your consideration. So if you look on what I sent out there uh, on page, where is it? Page six, you know, that's really what the new porch looks like. And uh, my request is you take a look at the drawings I've submitted, uh, consider what I'm trying to do, and if it's in the spirit of community development for Riverside and appropriate for the house. Uh, and if you agree, 
then uh, I'm not sure what the remedies are, but I would ask you to uphold my appeal or grant a variance or whatever the possible steps are. Do you have anything else? That's all, thank you. Well, um, and I, our village attorney can explain the legal process of this. Would be the, the technical matter is that, that this really came to the Planning and Zoning Commission as an appeal from a decision by the zoning administrator. So, <coughs> Mr. Molina, if you could explain. Yeah, so, the, I, I understand that you felt that the Planning and Zoning Committee wasn't able to reach a decision, but the fact of the matter is that the uh, building director did make an interpretation and it is that's where initial jurisdiction is to make such a determination and that's the presumption is that that's valid unless it's overturned so in order to be overturned you need enough positive votes of the body that would do that so it's not they did make a decision in the sense that they were there you did not successfully overturn the community, the, the building director's interpretation. And under the, under the code, under the, under the village code, the final authority for interpretations lies with that body, not with the village board. Um, so, and, and as you had stated, if the code is amended or changed in a way where the rules change, that could affect your ability to build the porch, but it would have to go through, it couldn't just, the board couldn't just take action. It would have to go through a text amendment process to the zoning code, it would have to have a public hearing, and then ultimately this village board would make that final determination as to whether a change was appropriate. So that's where you stand right now. So probably the best, the best course of action I, for, in, from your perspective would be the Planning and Zoning Commission is going to be talking about this whole WPA issue, is to let them talk it through. And if they reach a, if they reach a conclusion that, that something needs to be changed with our ordinances, they will bring that to us. And then we could see if that's something that, that this board wants to do. And if it turns out that that had a positive impact in terms of what you're trying to do, then you, then you could come back. But as a, because of the, the legalities of this, there's nothing that we can do tonight. Great. Well, thank you very much. I understand. Can I ask one question? And this is probably a song, yeah. um, Did this encroach in the setback, what he was proposing? Or was he within his setback? In other words, could he do an addition of six feet beyond? No. It does encroach in the setback. The, the, way the, the way the WPA works, they create the setback by, by documenting existing conditions when they right. were made. Which is at the front of your house. Yeah. Well, or, yeah, or exactly where a porch was if it wasn't from right. here. Right. Yeah. Right. You had something else, Mr. Well, uh, I was just going to clarify setback and encroachment is defined. Encroachment is defined by where the setback is. And the difference is, is that the WPA maps say that the setback is in one place, and the interpretation of the ordinance says that the setback is in a different place, which is why there was an appeal to the decision. Right. Okay. Yeah, I think we're familiar with that issue. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else like to address the board? Mr. Callis? There we go. Uh, good evening, Mr. President, trustees, those in attendance, and to those watching at home. Sir, I come before you and the Village Board on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce. It is my pleasure to inform the public of upcoming Chamber events. Uh, Chamber would like to publicly thank the Riverside Arts Weekend for starting off summer a great weekend and a huge success at the art fair we had in late May. Uh, the Revens were playing, the vendors enjoyed it being, uh, being out there. Uh, it's overall a huge success. Uh, we've had, uh, and now there's farmers markets out there too, so it's, it's a good time to get out and socialize with your neighbors. Uh, we've had one cruise night event this summer, but we do have two more. The next one will be on Thursday, July 14th, also on East Avenue, as well as Thursday, August 11th. Um, and then, of course, we'll have a car show in September. I'll be back at a later date to discuss more details on that. Um, I also want to ask people to save the date for second annual Riverfest, Chamber of Commerce's block party, which will be on July 23rd, also on East Avenue. Uh, 
Choo Choo has her new summer menu out, and of course we expect the opening of Saw Millie, as well as other restaurants in town. Uh, Chamber would like to thank Jessica and Sonia for overseeing a very well organized uh, streetscaping here on Burlington Street. Uh, I mean, I realize it's messy and all that stuff, but it's gonna look great. Uh, we're very pleased with how it's looking so far. Um, and we, of course, remind our residents to patronize local businesses. And that's all I have tonight. There are some great things to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. And congratulations on your re-election as president of the Lions Club. Thank you. Anyone else like to address the board this evening? Here and then we'll move on to our regular agenda. First up is the report to village, op village officers. Uh, the only thing I have tonight is I just wanted to give an update on the East Quincy Street application uh, for the uh, Illinois Transportation Enhancement Program grant. Uh, it has been submitted, but I wanted to specifically thank uh, our legislators who, to a person, stood up to provide letters of support uh, in behalf of our, of our application. And so we, we were able to receive letters from Senators Durbin and Kirk, Representatives Lipinski and Gutierrez, Senator Sandoval and Landek, and Representatives Zaleski and Tavares. So we greatly appreciate their, their support for our village efforts. And that is all I have this evening. I do not have a report this evening. Next up is the approval of the consent agenda. Are there any items that anyone needs to be removed for discussion? Hearing none, I'd ask for a motion and second to approve. Motion by Ms. Collins. Second by Mr. Pollock, please call the roll. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Longston. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Sedeby. I'm going to have to abstain. Motion carries. Uh, well, we need, we need you to vote. We need four affirmative votes. Okay. Aye. That's easy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Next up are reports of departments, commissions, and trustee liaisons. Any liaison reports this evening? Hearing none, the first item is a motion of the Village of Riverside, Illinois to accept the Village of Riverside's comprehensive annual financial report for the fiscal year ended December 31, 2015. Mr. Salinas. Good evening. Um, for board review tonight is the Village's comprehensive annual report, better known as the CAFR, for the fiscal year ending December 31st, 2015. Per state statute, the Village of Riverside is required to have an annual audit perform of the Village's accounts and funds by an independent audit firm. Uh, the fiscal year 2015 audit was performed by the firm Lauterbach and Amen, and they, they performed the audit for four consecutive years now. Uh, Matt Barron, partner at Lauterbach and Amen, is present tonight and will be providing the board with an overview of the 2015 CAFR, and both he and I will be available to answer any questions that the board might have at the conclusion of the presentation. Finally, once the CAFR has been approved, uh, Finance Department will uh, post the uh, CAFR along with the management letter on the village website so it, it will be available for public viewing and then we'll also, uh, per statute, uh, file the report with the Illinois Office of the Comptroller. So we'll introduce Matt Barron uh, with Lauterbach and Amon. Not sure if you wanted to bring that down. Right <laughs> you could have to put it right back where it was now. Um, Hi, hello, uh, I'm Matt Barron, you. partner with Lauterbach and Amon. Can you hear it okay? Is that all right? Um, here to present the CAFR and the management letter for the year ended December 31st, 2015 audit. So I'm gonna start off with the management letter this year to get through it, because I feel like it segues nicely into what happened within the audit report this year. So everybody has the management letter in front of them. Um, what our management letter is, we're giving best practices, we're giving other kind of in items that we feel the village should be implementing. It's typically broken into two parts. We have a current section, which is any new comments we're giving, and then we have a prior section, which is all of our management letter comments we've given in the past with an update on what happened with them. So this year we had one current, which is funds over budget. It's the debt service fund, $15,000, really not a big deal it's just something we have to do as auditors to tell you as the board as the board level and that's why we included it in here and included the footnotes of the financial statements there were also two prior year recommendations one was implemented one was not the one not implemented is these commingled cash being negative we were working with marco we'll get this one resolved in the coming years um, but the one that really stands out being implemented this year is the Gatsby 6768. So that's been implemented into this year's financials. And when we get into that in the audit report, I'll point out to you 
where we see that really affecting this year's audit report. So um, is there any questions on the management letter? Um, can, you, can you address the funds over budget? Yeah, so what happened was um, the reason the debt service fund was over budget is that we under budgeted for debt service on our newest bond issuance, the 2015 um, street improvement bonds, the interest payments, the budget was obviously developed in late 2015, and at the time we hadn't closed on the, two, on the 2015 GEO bonds. Total interest for the year was 77,000. We had only budgeted 32,000. Um, and I failed to recognize that when we did the first budget amendment, uh, because I was, as part of the expenditures, I was also including any, um, what do call the, uh, other financing uses, whereas in the CAFR, other financing uses aren't really considered expenditures. So I guess the answer is if you include other financing uses, it's within budget. Okay. So this sense. has been rectified, basically. Okay. Perfect. Okay. All right. Well, uh, let's flip on forward to the audit report itself. Does everyone have a copy of that in front of you? Like this. So first page I'm going to highlight to you is a few pages in and it looks like this. This is your Certificate of Achievement Award. Um, we submitted the Village's CAFR last year for the Certificate of Achievement. It was received, that's why it's been included within these, uh, this audit report. We're going to be submitting again this year and see no reason why uh, the Village won't be receiving that award again. A couple pages after that is the opinion letter. It has the Lauterbach name and letterhead on it. We gave the village an unqualified opinion again this year, which is the highest opinion that we give. Basically that's saying that these, the numbers in here are free of material misstatement or in other words, the numbers are what they say they are. A couple pages after that is the management discussion and analysis. In short, and it means MDNA. What this section is, this is a summary of everything else that's within this audit report. So if you want to go to a spot where you can read what happened within the village in narrative form, summary of uh, how the income statement went, what the balance sheet did, this would be the spot to go. But since I'm going to be covering that within my report, let's flip on past it. So at the bottom you can see it says MDNA 1, it'll say MDNA 2, etc. There's 17 pages of MDNA, so flip past MDNA 17, and we'll get to the true pages 3 and 4. On pages three and four, this is what we call the government-wide financial statements. What these are, this is a summary of all your funds combined into one spot on what we call full accrual accounting. So this is where we're adding in your non-current assets, i.e. your capital assets, and your non-current debt, so, or non-current liabilities, which would be your debt and your um, pension liabilities. So at the bottom of page four is your net position number of where we're at. At the end of the year, we're at 5.6 million positive. And you can see right above it's the ugly minus $12 million number of unrestricted cash. This is where we're starting to talk the conversation with GASB 68 of what happened this year. Um, GASB is the Governmental Accounting Standards Board. They decided this year to change their pension standards and how we are supposed to account for the numbers. The way it used to be, if you kept up with your pension contributions, you were square. You had zero net pension liability. Now, it's what is left yet to be funded, okay? So what do we have yet to go to be at 100% funded by the year 2040, okay? So you can see halfway up in the middle, there's this section, non-current liabilities. In there, you can see the new lines, net pension IMRF, oh, liability IMRF, net pension liability pension, or police pension. IMRF, your number's at $1 million. That, what you have with your IMRF is 89% funded. So the remaining 11% is the $1 million. For your police pension fund, it's 26% funded, and that's your $22 million. That number raised this year because of changes with your actuary. You guys lowered your interest rate assumption to be more in line, and that obviously raised up your liability quite a bit. And there was a, um, 
the pension fund did not do as well or did not perform as well with their, its investments and their returns. So that's how it raised $6 million from last year to this year. Any questions about this concept and what's going on here? Flip on pass, let's go forward to the pages seven and eight, and we're gonna get back to the funds that you guys are more comfortable and more used to seeing. Um, so these are your fund level financials. So there, you can see there's no changes on here from the past. GASB 68 did not affect your fund level financials. The one fund I'm gonna talk about is your general fund. At the bottom of page seven, you can see your general fund was at $5.5 million of net, uh, net position, or your fund balance. So what does that mean? How do we do? Let's go forward to pages 10 and 11. 10 and 11, we're seeing this is our income statement. General fund is all here on page 10. Halfway up, you can see this line called excess deficiencies of revenues over expenditures. It's a long accountant way of saying net operating income. You're at $360,000. How you ended up with a positive $360,000? Charges for services, permits came in over budget, so your revenues performed well. Expenditures came in below budget, and you were actually able to contribute an extra $30,000 this year to your police pension fund to allow for the $360,000, which you were then able to transfer to your capital project fund and keep funding for future capital projects. So an overall good year for the general fund. Okay, flipping forward, your other main fund I want to address is on page 13 and 14, your water and sewer funds. At the bottom of page 14, you can see the net position number, we're at $14 million for our water and sewer. 4.7 is unrestricted. On page 15, then, we can see the income statement to see how we did. At the bottom, you can see that 14.1 million of net position. A couple lines up is where we see 80,000 positive. So overall, the water fund ended up at 80,000 positive this year. Um, the revenues came in over budget. You were able to keep up with the Chicago water rate increases. And overall, your budget for expenses came in under budget with less capital and maintenance expenses that occurred this year. And that is my presentation of the audit. You guys have any questions? <coughs> Trustees, anyone? Please, Mr. Powell. Going back to the um, the pension yep. fund, um, where where are we relative to the state law uh, on the pension? I know that Gatsby is one thing that's different from the yeah. state so mandates. Right now, the the goal is to get yourself up to be fully funded by the year 2040. That's what your actuary's job is. So your actuary that you have actually has a, a method of doing their actuary to get you to 100% funded. What the state's method is, is to get you up to 90%. So you're actually trying to go a little bit above and beyond what the state is mandating by state statute. So what state is requiring is you to hit their state minimum actuary number, and you guys are past that, so you're meeting what their expectations are. And then you added an extra 30,000 this year. So. I think that's just something to keep an eye on as you move forward with your actuary, working with them to make sure you're comfortable with their assumptions and what levy amount that they're asking you to put up. So if I could summarize, make sure I understand it correctly, we're on target to meet or exceed the 90% funding by 2040? As long as you follow along. As long as we keep doing what we're doing. You do what you're supposed to be doing. What's required by the actuary. Right. Yes. Right. Assuming that 6.75% investment return. I think it's actually less than that. Are we at 6.7? 6.75? Six yeah. Okay. You lowered it from seven and a half, I think, to six and three quarters, something like that. So, yeah. Some of the years you've had over 10, and a year like this year, you're at minus one percent. So, what kind of estimated returns do you see in other villages? This year, it's mostly around the zero to slightly lower. That was mostly across the board. It, that, that, that December dip that happened kind of took everybody out for December. No, what I mean, where, where we're estimating 6.75, oh, what, um, what do you see with other other? That's pretty standard. We see anywhere between six and seven and a half. IMRF estimates seven and a half uh, all the time, and they came in low also this year, obviously. Um, 
it, a lot of it just depends on what you as a board are comfortable with, with your assumptions looking at it. So I've always, for years now, ever since I've been a trustee, I've wondered about this. Yeah. Um, what is, what is the, I mean, obviously people aren't getting that, right? Yeah. I mean, it depends on the year. It's a historical, over the course of time, they feel as if IMRF, historically, if you put all things, you know, the ups and downs, they were around 7.5%, and that's what they're assuming. Um, so obviously this year we had a drop, but a couple of years ago it was 10 and 11%. Okay. So, you know. So it's a historic and historic average. Historic, yes. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, before I go, I guess I want to say thank you to uh, Marco and his team. Again, we, uh, it was another good audit year. and appreciate all his hard work and everything that he does to get ready for the audit and all our follow-up requests. He's right on it right away. So I want to thank him for all his hard work. It's very nice of you to say. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to second that too. I mean, this, I mean, obviously this is an excellent report. And you know, when we see things like you know, repeated examples where our expenditures are, are coming in under budget, that's a, that's a testament to our staff and to the hard work that our finance department does. So I'd just like to say, yeah, job well done, and let's, let's keep it up. Could I, could I ask one question? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I meant to ask this. Um, does this latest um, GASB, I guess, um, pronouncement affect the income statement, or is it just a balance sheet item? It affects your income statement at that government-wide level. So it's not affecting your actual fund level, like right. the general fund and those that you're truly budgeting for. But at that government-wide level is where it affects it. It flows through the income statement. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So a big loss. They actually allow you to smooth that across three to five years when you have a big loss like you did this year. Um, that's a lot of extra actuary stuff that you don't need to really know <laughs> or probably don't care to know too much about. But yes, it does go through. The but but that effect is minimal compared to the balance sheet effect that we're seeing, right? The income statement ultimately leads to the balance sheet effect. All right. Like it has to hit the it has to hit, hit the income statement first to then get onto the balance sheet. But we didn't restate. We so did do a restatement. There is a restatement yes. this year. Okay. Right. To implement it the first year, we had to implement or Got we it. had to restate. And it was uh, fifteen point five million, I think, was our prior period adjustment. Got it. Got it. I'd ask for a motion and a second to approve the Village of Riverside, Illinois' uh, comprehensive annual financial report for the fiscal year ended December 31, 2015. So motion by Mr. Pollock. Second. Second by Mr. Sedeby. Discussion? Please call the roll. <coughs> Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Lumsden. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Sedeby. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you very much. <coughs> Next up is a report by Community Development Director Apt and the Economic Development Commission and our chairperson, Ms. Peters, is here tonight um, on the progr progress of the EDC's efforts on branding and marketing, and we're also going to see a uh, draft of a marketing video. So, Ms. Apt and Ms. Peters. Chairperson Liz Peters from our Economic Development Commission here with me to present to you an update of what we've been working on uh, for the past year uh, for our marketing efforts. Uh, in 2015, uh, the EDC identified as a goal the creation of a marketing plan, and as a part of that, they also wanted to get a marketing video. So they solicited proposals for both the marketing video, and then later on in the year, we issued an RFP for a marketing plan. Um, we selected the Nolan Collaborative uh, to create the marketing video, and Point B Communications was selected to begin a phase one of a marketing plan, which included a positioning statement, logo development, as well as the creation of way wayfinding signage design for our downtown. Um, the commission has been working very diligently on getting through these items. We do have um, a final of one of our videos uh, to present to you this evening as well. Um, you also have a copy of the what uh, Point B calls their Point A recap document, and in it it contains um, our long-term strategic competitive advantages, our positioning statement, and a brand manifesto um, that they worked with the Economic Development Commission to come up with. So, uh, 
Liz talk a little bit and then we can show the video and then maybe if we want to we can talk about the position need statement a little bit as well just so you guys can get acclimated to it because it's something that we're supposed to kind of be using. It's our elevator pitch to the world on why Riverside is an awesome place to do business and live and visit. So, Liz? The only thing I would add is that um, the commission has been working on various iterations of both of the video and the marketing plan and it's all, it's still a work in progress so we certainly would take input that you have and um, but we have put a lot of time and effort um, it's been a very comprehensive process to get a lot of input from a lot of different people and a lot of, a lot of different um, a lot of different groups so if you have any comments please that's what we want to hear from you all right I think do we want to see the video first, or do we want to talk about the recap document well, let's, first? Let's watch the video. Oh, that's the part. All right, I'm going to give Riverside TV a second to get um, the audio switched over. Outside, the be a little quieter. Do we need to log back in? Is that the problem? visited Riverside a few times for dinner with friends and when we drove through you know we were like wow what is this place it was the type of place that we would like where there was a lot of green space the trees Riverside is the first conservation design community in America with an emphasis on mass transit on walkability no matter where you work in the Chicago area when you come back into Riverside, it's home. And families, you know, are walking along the streets. You see them enjoying life together. Riverside was premised on the notion that beauty and business go together. Olmsted's original idea was to have a place of solace and peace that also provided all of the modern conveniences of the time. I think there's a culture that welcomes businesses. People are very loyal to local businesses. If you're looking for some authentic space to have a business presence, you'd find that in Riverside. It's a unique space. The name of the store is Aunt Diana's. I've worked here for 42 years. We have a, a big fan base, mostly from the area. I've had client lists for 30 years. We've been in business here since 1983. I'll tell you, where the garage is and being near the water tower, this is an awesome spot. Kind of nice to be able to just work out here. Clientele in the neighborhood is really good. One of the things that we've been working on over the last couple of years is really finding ways to make it easier for people to do business here. The Economic Development Commission has been focusing on um, unique ways to provide businesses with every advantage possible when they come to Riverside. One of the things we've been working on extensively is putting together a concrete marketing plan. And we've put in place a couple incentives this year. There's more incentives on the horizon. Um, so our goal is to provide as much positive experience for these new business owners coming in as possible so that they know we've got their back. The unique part about Riverside is that you don't feel like you're in a suburb. 
when you drive in uh, to Riverside, I think a lot of people will tell you that immediately the mood changes. And, and it's something that you can't necessarily put a finger on, but it's a feeling that you have. When you come into Riverside, the calm. I think that folks will find that Riverside is very easy to get to, but once you get here, I think you'll find it's kind of hard to leave. of what it, where we're going with it it's obviously focused toward business owners and that's the main goal the number one objective that we had with this video was this particular video was direct, directed to potential business owners so that they know exactly what they have here and the advantages that Riverside offers there are two other two other videos I think we have two other videos that are going to be um, made by Nolan collaborative as well they're also kind of in the process of being developed those are going to be more short like short clip kind of one minute two minute blurbs about specific aspects of Riverside um, they're not necessarily more of a marketing piece well they are a marketing piece but they're more something that we can uh, sh share with people if they're interested in specific aspects of Riverside right they're gonna be providing a short video that we can use to kind of promote the town for either new residents or for visitors and then he'll also be providing some shorter clips that are probably from some of the different interviews that he did to kind of have a little social social media clips on different businesses and business owners in town for people to get some more information um, about the village and kind of go a little bit deeper than just the snippets that you got in the overall marketing video and, and the goal is truly to get this, this video and all the other videos out into social media. It really, we talked a lot about that when we first just were deciding whether or not to go with a video because it is an expensive process. And what, what, you know, what's our work product at the end? So what we hope is that we can take this video and all the other videos and really you know, branch it out into social media, <clears throat> get it in, in front of the right people, and make it be something that is sustainable out there on the internet and elsewhere, as opposed to just a video that's nice and then kind of disappears. Um, so our goal is to <clears throat> work with Nolan Collaborative to figure out creative ways of, of maintaining that vi this video and, and other videos um, in the spotlight, if you will. So that's our marketing video and the progress that we've made on that. I think we're pretty happy with the product we have so far. Um, and hopefully uh, we'll get the last couple things taken care of here in the next month or so. And getting that all finalized and up. And uh, we're working on updating our website, as you know. And we'll definitely be incorporating all of that as part of the website redesign for, for the Village's website. Uh, you also have before you... Uh, oh, yes. Well, help me understand the thinking behind doing the marketing video before we do the marketing plan. Well, it's a great question. <laughs> um, it really, it kind of, it was more of a natural development. And it's great, don't get me wrong. I think that, you know, especially President Sells, I mean, it was, it was <laughs> spectacular. Well, so we actually started off thinking that we wanted to do the marketing video to see how, how it worked, to be completely honest. We weren't sure about the whole marketing plan, whether or not the board would be on board with this, whether or not you know, the, the commission would be able to take a, mark, a you know, robust marketing plan and really make it work. Um, budget was another question that came up. So, um, so we decided we had a budget last year to do the video. And so we took the, you know, the month that we had and we decided to dedicate that to the video and then we focused on the marketing plan, the more robust aspects of the marketing plan this year and for phase one, which Sonia's about to tell you about, and then phase two would be sometime in the future. So the goal was kind of to ease ourselves in and, and convince you and convince you know, our constituents that this is worth the, the amount of money that we're spending. It's worth developing these tools, these marketing tools for the village and we want to see the payback for it. So that was kind of our dipping our toe in with the, with the video. It got us a very tangible thing to be able to product to show to show people. And also part of working with Nolan Collaborative was that um, he can use what we have from the marketing plan and incorporate that into the video and he's talked about being able to change the video and he actually did some in the process as we got some of the information from Plan B, he did um, incorporate that into the video also. The, uh, yeah, some of the quotes 
Right there, you saw it came directly out of the positioning statement and some of the target audience uh, pieces that are talked about in the, in the point B's document that you have in front of you. So, so that's that. For the marketing plan, uh, phase one, we had a very productive meeting with point B and got us to the point of having this point A recap document. Um, the highlight of it, I guess, would be our positioning statement, which is you know, supposed to be something that we're all supposed to take to heart and memorize and all be kind of on message, as, uh, as it were. So the positioning statement is, as one of the nation's first planned suburban communities, and one of only two villages in the state designated an arboretum, Riverside is truly the hidden gem of suburban Cook County. Its incomparable design, pastoral setting, and unparalleled small town ambiance offers its residents, business owners, and visitors alike the chance to experience the kind of safe, neighborly American small town life that has all but disappeared in today's modern world. So as I said before, that's supposed to be kind of our, our 30 second elevator pitch on you know what is Riverside and why you would want to be a part of it. The document also outlines some of our long-term strategic competitive advantages, and it compared us to some other communities to try to um, identify kind of where our strengths are compared to some other communities. And what they identified were that uh, we have, from its very inception, Riverside was designed to harmoniously coexist with its natural surroundings, providing visitors and residents with an idyllic, tranquil retreat. Um, and then it goes on to talk a little bit more about that, as us being one of the first planned suburban communities. Um, it's been recognized as an arboretum for our stewardship of the landscape, our winding roads and generous green space that provide the village with a park-like setting, all just minutes away from downtown Chicago. We have Riverside is truly unique in its ability to provide residents a safe, quiet, charming small town which rests just minutes from one of the nation's largest metropolises. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, we also have the third one is that Riverside is a truly unique community with an architectural and historical pedigree that surpasses that of many better known communities throughout Illinois. This is page 19. Yeah, in your document. So the EDC reviewed this and accepted this document, and so now you have it before you as well. And uh, point B has taken this document, and the items in it has used it to start the logo creation. So they presented to the EDC kind of the first concepts of logos that they've kind of gone through and make their rec made their recommendations. Uh, we hopefully will have um, an actual recommendation on a logo to you uh, by the second meeting in July. Uh, for us to start moving on that. Once we've selected the logo um, and decided on, finalized on that, then point B will be able to move forward with starting the design for the wayfinding signage for the downtown, because that's the, the last part of this first phase. Um, after this, the EDC would like to move forward with kind of the full-blown marketing plan portion of it, and um, we had talked about that last year when we were setting up the budget for this year to do the marketing plan budget constraints, this uh, full marketing plan is a little bit more than we had anticipated budget-wise. So hopefully we'll be budgeting next year to kind of complete the marketing plan to come up with some real strategies for how we go out and, and market the market the village and come up with actual um, you know physical marketing materials as well that incorporate the logo design and the positioning statement and kind of uh, give us that tool to move forward and really promote the village and uh, get people in. There is one other component of the, the phase one that, that point B is working on, and that's the wayfinding signage. And so they will be taking, once this logo is finalized and developed, which hopefully will be sometime early fall, then they'll be designing the wayfinding signage to be put up throughout the, the, the village yeah, and also downtown. identifying you know, the best locations for them potentially to, to put those signs up. So that's, the, the, I guess, the third component of the phase one. And then the phase two is what Sonia's talking about, which is kind of going forward and developing the materials um, and taking what we have and, and really making it a robust marketing marketing program. Mm -hmm. Comments, questions? I just wanted to say also, uh, point B, sometimes you know, you make decisions on what firm to go with and you're not sure which one you should choose and sometimes it's a very difficult decision. And um, there was some, not con but discussion about, you know, which one to go with. And um, 
and Point B was chosen, and their work has just been phenomenal, I think. And um, they really do a great job of pinpointing what the strengths are of each community and then helping you to figure out how to use those strengths uh, to your best advantage. And so I just think it's been a great experience with them. And um, as we look into doing further marketing, I would just say that they are definitely someone that we want to uh, strongly consider. So I just had one question. I mean, obviously, you're all doing an amazing job. I mean, the EDC is hitting on all cylinders, and you're, I know you're working really hard, and it shows, and this is beautiful. Do you have any idea how they ranked, how they... What, the, what data they use to try to compare us to other, and I'm looking at page 12 of their yep. report, page 299 of the uh, packet. It was actually the EDC and Trustee Collins and myself that were part of the group that we had the special meeting, and we kind of worked through these different things and how these community, we thought we ranked, or these communities ranked against us for those different items. So. Um, it was just kind of a give and take as the commission kind of discussed through those items where we decided the ranking. And it was be. really an interesting process. It took almost all day, <laughs> literally all day, to go through this whole point A collaborative process where they, <clears throat> they walk you through and they talk about what each of these characteristics really mean. So awareness, character, and history. And they talk about, well, what does that really mean and how do we rank that when you look at your village compared to XYZ. And it took a long time. It, it, like I said, it took almost all day to not just do this, but the positioning statements and um, the strat the long-term, I always say it wrong, long-term long strategic, strategic competitive, competitive advantages. advantages. Those things we all kind of came up with over the course of like an eight-hour meeting. And it was, it was through input that we had actually, you know, the EDC is constantly soliciting things from uh, you know the community members so we take that came into this meeting obviously we have the village represented um, and trustee Collins was there and, and we were able to kind of collaborate and come together on various aspects sometimes we disagreed sometimes we agreed but we were able to come to a middle ground on a lot of these things mm -hmm. and that just kind of showed to us that this is a, this is something that's not only possible but it's it, that this is likely accurate because we're coming to the middle ground on a lot of things here that we, you know, started off with, well, we're not really sure, are we really that, people really aware of us? And then we talked about it more and we figured out, oh, well, this is kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about awareness. All right, maybe they aren't really aware of us as compared to Oak Park or LaGrange, so. And I think that that was um, what Point B does is, a good, what one of the things that they do a good job of is facilitating this mm -hmm. because originally you might think well that's not right that would be and so we would say that and then he'd be like well wait a second but I you know here's my perspective on it and then we'd be like oh wait well maybe yeah that is the case so mm -hmm. it did make you look at things a little bit differently than what you automatically assume up front mm -hmm. well with all due respect to Oak Park how did they get a plus four on community involvement <laughs> um, act for it was types of activities and yeah, that type of yeah, thing. Activity, it was, yeah. and so it depends on how you can yeah, define. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. and, and we talked about the fact that in Riverside, uh, like the volunteerism I think is it's really so high, strong, exactly. Right. Yes. But that's not exactly what that was looking at. That was more of a, um, was that like the activities. events type? Yeah, yeah. 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 events yeah. and attachments, well. mm -hmm. yes. Well, events and activities was another one, okay. a separate one as well, but. Um, oh yeah, the community. But we're gonna catch them. Exactly. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> So. This is our own perception exactly. of our ranking. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And it could be different for different people. Right. And, and like Liz said, when we first started it, um, one of the exercises, you put a dot on a scale as to where you thought things were. And it was interesting because we had different groups. And some people would have something way over here, and other people would have something mm -hmm. way over here. And it's like, okay, wait, what are we? You know, are we casual? So we talked we? through it. And you know, sometimes it was just a different interpretation of what a word meant, right. and so in the end, we all kind of ended up on the somewhat on the same page. So that's the uh, pr brand or uh, personality profile is the one that yeah. she was just talking about. So, well, I'm excited to see the logo. Looking forward to it. Absolutely, they're they're really great. We've got them narrowed down to three or four, and we're working to finalize that. And I think all of them are fantastic. I think so. they had promised how many? They had originally promised us that they would provide us with 10, and they came to us with 15 concepts. Mm -hmm. um, and so the... And then, they, and then we went back with them to them with 
three or four that we thought were the top. And we said, but we'd like to see this change slightly. And so e for each one, they came back with four new, or three or four three, new yeah. versions of that logo. So we have a lot to choose from. So, you know, if you don't like what we end up presenting, there are, <laughs> we don't need to go back to the drawing board. There's plenty <laughs> other logos out there. But, yeah. We appreciate all of your efforts. Yeah. And I would just like to thank the EDC also. Um, they've done an enormous amount of work this year and, um, and it, it shows in the product that they're presenting here tonight and we really appreciate that. And that includes you, Trustee Conte. That's right. <laughs> thank She's you very our much. leader. <laughs> okay, now back to the grind. Yeah, fun's over. Yeah, fun's over. <laughs> yes. <laughs> close, we're getting close. Okay, so now we move on to ordinances and resolutions. First up, and the, the, the first uh, two of these have to do with the uh, joint dispatch that um, Manager Francis is gonna describe. Uh, so the first one is a resolution approving and authorizing the execution of an intergovernmental inter agreement entered into the, by the village, villages of Brookfield, North Riverside, and Riverside to establish an intergovernmental cooperative venture known as West Central Consolidated Communications, or WC3, for the operation and maintenance of a combined dispatch and communications system. Ms. Francis. Um, the Village's E911 board discussed Senate Bill 096 when it was passed and became Public Act 99-006 in July of 2015. At that time, it was unknown whether the act would be repealed or if the deadlines noted in the act would ch be changed. However, the deadlines remain unchanged, and so we are progressing with consolidated dispatch. In late 2015, village staff began evaluating our options. Village staff, meaning myself, the police department, Chief Weitzel and his staff, and also Chief Buckley and his staff. Um, upon evaluation, also Chief Weitzel began discussing the option of consolidating with North Riverside in early 2016. Um, even though at that point in time, our combined population was less than the 25,000 required in population, we still moved forward because we thought it was a viable option and we were hopeful that another community would want to become a part of our partnership, which in fact was the case because shortly thereafter, Brookfield had asked to become part of it. And so between that time, we've begun working with GovHR representative to handle project management throughout this process to then come up with the IGA that is before you. Um, it is important to note that the IGA states that the village manager of Riverside will be the chair of the board of directors of the West Central Consolidated Communications for the first two years. Thereafter, there will be a rotation of the members of the various board members. A new chair will be appointed with a two-year term. North Riverside will provide lockup services to the Village of Riverside, and the Village of Riverside will handle all financial-related matters for the Consolidated Dispatch Center. Once this IGA is approved, and additionally the ordinance that is the next item on the agenda dissolving our ETSB is approved, um, we will then forward an executed agreement for the North Riverside and Brookfield to execute. That will be submitted as part of our application to the state. Then the communities will work with GovHR to complete the following. We'll be looking to recruit an executive director for the dispatch center who will handle the oversight of the day-to-day -day operations and will report to the board of directors. They will establish a budget for the center. We'll oversee evaluation and installation of necessary infrastructure to have the Consolidated Dispatch Center and draft and approve policies and procedures for the center. Both Chief Buckley and Chief Weitzel are here to ask, answer any additional questions the board may have as well as myself. So before we get there, I'd ask for a motion and a second to approve the resolution. So moved. Motion by Ms. Collins, Sorry. second by Mr. Olmsted. Questions, comments? Sorry guys, going on here? I think my question is, is this something you guys want, need, and fully support? Well, it's mandated by law. So, <laughs> number one. Answer, so now that. they want it. So uh, the but, but this arrangement, these partners, I mean, I mean, that's that's where the rubber meets the road, right? Yeah, I believe both, um, at least from the police perspective, I'll let Matt speak for the fire, but we've all been involved, the manager, myself, 
uh, the fire chief, my deputy chief's directly involved. Um, we know the chiefs and deputy chiefs in North Riverside and Brookfield. They've come up through the ranks. We did look at other options. The board should know that and th those board members that were here in 2008 and 2009 when I took over as chief, we visited Southwest Central Dispatch. We visited NORCOM, which is up north. We got proposals that were in the five and $600,000 a year. The board chose not to do that back then. Um, so, and then we've also looked at it years ago, we looked at a combined uh, system with Lions and um, we, we did that again this time. So, um, and we even looked at the River Forest Dispatch Center, which is a center that's up and running. From my perspective, I want it to be on, for safety reasons for the officers, I want it to be on our radio frequency with our neighbors because when we need help, River Forest isn't coming to help us. <clears throat> Okay, that was one of my big issues. North Riverside is, Lyons is, the towns that are immediately adjacent to us are coming to us when we need help. So I needed to ensure that we could be on the same radio frequencies and get help. Um, so when Brookfield finally came on, I think it was a big plus for us. Um, and everybody's going through this same process right now. Um, there are some towns that thought, like the manager said, that they could get away with um, delaying it. That's not possible. The law is the law. The legislators made it clear to us they're not repealing it. You better move forward or they're going to start finding municipalities. So those municipalities that think they don't have to do this are in for a rude awakening. That's not going to happen. Um, our issues have been addressed. Um, our lockup issue is being addressed. Um, we'll need to do some uh, changes going forward in our physical facility and our lockup and our uh, lobby. But many communities have their dispatch centers open Monday through Friday, 8 to 4, 9 to 5. They're closed weekends. They're, they're closed after business hours. Those are all issues we will address going forward. Um, so I think it's been very, very positive. And I, I'm very happy to work with North Riverside and Brookfield. Um, I'm very glad Brookfield came on. So from police perspective, they are the right, right partners. I do believe that. Um, Matt, you might want to come. Absolutely. And you know, the first thing I want to say is you asked if this is something we wanted to do. And my first response is going to be no. We have an excellent dispatch center here in Riverside with excellent dispatchers. But because we don't have a choice in this matter, we found partners that we could work with and that would work well with us. Um, I try to tell people, you know, a dispatcher is a person that you might see through the front window as you come into the lobby or a person you call on the phone or somebody that you hear at the end of the radio. But their job is vital. Their job is vital to everybody in this community. Um, I always try to tell people that when we have a fire or there's a major incident going, in, going on in town or a storm that comes through or a flood, our dispatchers do an excellent job, but there's one person sitting in there. Um, our service is going to be enhanced by doing this. Uh, they're going to have two dispatchers minimum sitting working the desk, um, which will help us out tremendously because if there is a fire or a major um, event going on, they're going to be able to answer the phone at the same time another dispatcher is going to be talking on the radio and not just have one person try and answer 911 and talk on the radio and talk to somebody at the window and multiple calls coming in. So it's going to help enhance our services. So at the end of the day, it's going to be much better. So definitely we are in support of this. What is the combined population of the three? So for 30,000. It is. It is. With Brook Brookfield will be the biggest community joining yeah. us. But it's close to 29,000, I believe, when it's all said and done. The well, with the three communities, it'll, I believe, 34,000, a little bit over 34,000 yeah. is where we're going to be okay. when it's uh, with the three communities. Is it expandable? If somebody else wants to join in and participate? We've already received inquiries. So first, we're, we're focusing on, the group has agreed, yeah. we're focusing yeah. on our IGA. But yes, North Riverside, their facility does allow the ability to expand the, the mm -hmm. footprint just based on purely the location and the open space surrounding the dispatch center currently. Mm -hmm. um, it's just going to be more or less the question of how far do we want to expand because we also want to be cognizant of not diminishing services. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think probably the question the public wants to know the most is, uh, will we have a 24-hour police station? You know, I plan, myself and the manager plan on bringing that back to the board, but I don't believe that that is feasible. Um, 
because the economics of that probably will drive it. Plus, if we're locking our prisoners up in North Riverside, that big component we don't have at our facility anymore. Um, you know, I did a study six, seven years ago. We had a little clicker at the front desk of our lobby on how many people came in after midnights, and only people that come in are to bond people out. So there's like two or three people occasionally. The foot traffic into the facility is not um, a lot, obviously. So I, I don't think so. Um, I, I, I think that we are probably going to close. That's probably a, a discussion we'll have. Um, so there will be. Um, some design changes that will need to be required for the front of the station, but you know we we're not breaking any ground by closing our facility up front, um, twenty or keeping it open twenty four hours a day. Many municipalities our size do the same thing. Um, it's very accepted. We'll have it videotaped. It'll be live. It'll be a phone directly to the center. Um, we'll have some secure type of ATM lobby, so if somebody was to run in there and somebody was chasing them, they would have an opportunity to not let somebody in. So well, there'll be a lot of thought that will go into that, and I'm sure we'll come back to the board with that, but um, my perspective would be that we would not be open 24 hours a day. The lobby would not be open. I, I can say, say the same thing for the residents. Um, Having a 24-hour station is a rare luxury for a town like Riverside, it's, and I've always appreciated having it. But it's an expensive luxury that you know that not too many villages like Riverside, our size, has. So, um, and then um, I guess my the only other question is, what is the bottom line cost difference, short term and long term? Right now, so moving forward until everything is officially consolidated, each village will pay the related personnel expenses. Right now, because we're evaluating, each village will maintain their full-time positions when, when the center is consolidated. There may not be the need for as many part-time positions as each community has. However, we're also going to have to evaluate a records clerk for the police department because our dispatchers used to handle that during their downtime. Um, so we're evaluating the numbers and what the net impact will be. Obviously this is mandated either way, um, but we don't have a final number as it relates to what it's going to cost. It may There may be some upfront costs over time though it will level out to be, I, I believe, a cost savings to the village overall. Does this help our evidence? issue? Pardon me? Does this help evidence storage? Does that get consolidated or do we keep all that investigation stuff? No. That, that all stays keep okay. all that. I wish it did. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it did. We still have uh, that mandate for mostly yeah. probably 30 years and, and, and over for most cases. Okay. But it may, it may have an opportunity for us in the future to redesign some of the space that's not being used with the old dispatch yeah. center. So going forward we may, you know, in the years to come we may be able to find some more space. Where is the physical location? Is it at the Village Common? Is that the, where will this be located? In it's going to be inside the North Riverside Police Station. They have a much larger facility. They have a very large footprint is that now. On, is that on Displays? Yeah, it's at okay. uh, 2300 block of Displays. Okay. So even when we're transporting our prisoners out of town, our officers will be out of town one block from 26 and Displays to the 2300 right. block of Displays there. So um, I, I, don't, I, th I, don't, I think that'll have a minimal impact. Questions. Okay, I would just, I guess, I would just add that uh, this, this really is a testament to a lot of great leadership, on, especially on behalf of Manager Francis. She's really been spearheading this, this project with the help of our, our two chiefs, and I think that's shown by the fact that she's going to be the first chair of the, the Consolidated Dispatch. So, um, it's, uh, it's been a, a, a lot of work, as you can see. But it's something that we have to do by law, and I'm really glad that we had the foresight to get out in front of it and, uh, and avoid the potential downside of not meeting the requirements. So thank you to all of you for the hard work you've done. Thank you. Yes, the manager's been very aggressive at our meetings. She, she's a very <laughs> arm wrestle. Very, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I find that so hard in the position that um, <laughs> the, uh, I think it's important because um, I think Matt. And I and the manager, we wanted to make sure we partnered with the right communities. And I think the manager was on board with that, and that's really what made this go through. We needed to have, and I think the two communities were partnering with our excellence.
this is going to be good for everyone. I was going to add that um, there are maybe communities ignoring the mandate, but that even communities that are trying to make it, some are making it. So it's a testament that this was all pulled together. Thank so with you. that, any other discussion? I would ask for you to call the roll. Pallas. Aye. Trustee Lumsden. There was, there was, aye. There was a motion. Trustee Pallas. Aye. Trustee Seppi. Aye. Motion carries. Now we move to the second part of this, which is, this is a long one, so bear with me. An ordinance amending Title I, Administration, Chapter 18, Police Matters, Section 1, 1811, Emergency Telephone System Board of the Village Code of the Village of Riverside. Dissolve the Riverside Emergency Telephone System Board and recognize the Village of Riverside's participation in a joint emergency telephone system board created via an intergovernmental agreement establishing a consolidated joint emergency dispatch system known as the West Central Consolidated Communications WC3. So I'd ask for a motion and second to approve. Motion by Mr. Lumsden. Second. Second by Ms. Collins. Are there any questions about this? matter. Please call the roll. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Lumsden. Aye. Trustee Pollack. Aye. Trustee Sedman. Aye. Motion carries. Next up is an ordinance accepting a real estate purchase contract and authorizing the purchase by the village of real property located at 2710 South Harlem Avenue, Riverside, Illinois. Ms. Francis. So to recap, uh, at the April 21st, 2016 board meeting, the board had directed myself to execute an agreement to evaluate a potential business district on Harlem Avenue. Um, during that meeting, we had discussed some potential proposals. As part of that evaluation, it was brought up um, at the staff level that 2710 Harlem Avenue was for sale. Um, that particular piece of property was listed for 160000 It was previously a dry cleaner. However, no business has been done out of that storefront for over six, the past six months. Um, and when it was in operation, the outer hours were sporadic at best. Um, this property would be instrumental in developing the entire area of the proposed business district by potentially combining and developing the parcels to the north or south of 2710 Harlem Avenue. To the north of this property is the title mats, which is currently vacant, and to the south is a strip center, which is partially vacant. As noted by village staff during the business district discussion, over the past few months, staff has received a number of inquiries about the village's plan to address the vacant storefronts along Harlem Avenue. Within the packet is the contract. Um, it notes that the initial earnest money would be 8000 8, However, it increases to 15000 once the phase one site assessment is completed. There is also a timeline that which is included. Um, currently, the property owner has already done some remediation and has provided the village with a no further remediation letter. The contract provides the village with a 180-day due diligence period. And as noted, it is inclusive within the document. I, I want to also point out if the village board does approve um, executing and accepting this real estate agreement, um, this would be a budget variance in the capital projects fund. So I just want the board to be aware of that. Okay, so first I'd ask for a motion and second to approve the ordinance. So moved. Motion by Mr. Sadevi. Second. Second by Mr. Lumsden. Any questions concerning this? Um, just to put this in a little bit broader context for our, our residents, uh, this is the, the dry cleaner that's there on Harlem Avenue. We're looking to try to draw attention to this area for potential redevelopment. We would like to see a proper gateway there for uh, an entry point to our, our village. <coughs> uh, simultaneously with, the, with, this, with this contract, we are also going to be issuing a request for proposals to potential developers looking for developers who are interested possibly in working with the village to redevelop that, that area. And we are also going to be moving forward with the evaluation of the business district. We probably will have be ha having that conversation at our meetings in August. So this is kind of a three-prong a three effort here to try to draw attention to an area that has languished but has great potential, especially along a busy stretch of, of Harlem like that. So. Um, this is an exciting opportunity, I think, for the village. So, 
Any other comments or questions? No? Please call the roll. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Lawson. Aye. Trustee Powell. Aye. Trustee Sotomayor. Aye. Motion carries. And last up is an ordinance amending the village code of the village of Riverside, Illinois, relative to hardscape in public areas. This is a continuation of a discussion we had a few months back. Um, and it's come back for decision time. Ms. Act. Yes, as you may recall, last summer, uh, you directed the village attorney and staff to uh, identify some issues regarding hardscape in our public right of ways and uh, present some recommendations. Those recommendations were reviewed by the Landscape Advisory Commission and the Preservation Commission uh, for their input and that was then brought before you for your decision on how to move forward with hardscaping and address signs. At the time you chose to put off deciding anything on the hardscape but did adopt changes regarding address signs that would allow them on private property in the front yard uh, with a minimum setback of one foot from the property line. Uh, some of the things that uh, the ordinance regarding hardscaping included was creating an administrative process for hardscape that's not permanently affixed to the ground and for walkways, patios, et cetera, that are, that are flush to the ground. It also required all hardscaping located in the right-of-way <clears throat> to have an executed right-of-way encroachment waiver, which indemnifies the village for any injuries or damages to person or property arising out of the related hardscape item in our, in our parkway. It also revised Chapter 12 of the Building Code uh, to clarify that structures in, in that section refers to objects that are permanently affixed to the ground. Objects that are not permanently affixed, such as benches or planters, uh, you know, like a, a planter pot, um, or any hardscape that's visible only at the ground level, such as a walkway um, or in-ground sprinklers, would not be subject to the process that's in um, Title IV, Chapter 12, which is for existing structures in the public right-of-way. Um, it also amend, or it also clarified that property lines in the village do not necessarily extend all the way to the public sidewalk and recommends that residents consult their survey or the building department to determine an acceptable location for the sign. It does keep in place our current hardscape process that goes before the Preservation Commission and the LAC for those items that are permanently affixed and come above grade. So like a lamp post or if somebody wanted to do um, like a pergola or something that encroaches into our right of way. That would require going through that hardscape permit process that we currently have in place now for any hardscaping in our public right of and our public right of way. So it goes before preservation for their comment, the Landscape Advisory Commission for their comment, and then ultimately comes to the village board for you to make the decision as to whether to allow that hardscape to, uh, to go into our public right of way. Um, I do have a note here um, that talks about our village's parkway. Um, our preservation ordinance specifically talks about our parkway as part of the planning concept of Riverside. And it says these public lands included the land adjacent to the Des Plaines River, two large commons, the triangular landscape parks and the roadways with their unique varying public parkway depths. These changing parkway depths allowed for natural tree groupings along the right of way in lieu of inline street planting. Um, Public Ways and Property Ordinance, which contains the hardscape permit, <coughs> pardon me, hardscape permit regulations, defines both the park, uh, defines the parkway as any portion of the right of way not improved by street or sidewalk. Our right of way for our roadway system extends from private property line on one side of the street to the private property line on the other side of the street. So that's our right of way. The parkway is going to be that area within those boundaries that doesn't have street on it or sidewalk on it. That's our parkway. Um, <clears throat> staff is bringing this matter before the board again for consideration because there have been violations of hardscaping in the public right of way without a permit recently and violation notices were sent out. Uh, the proposed changes to our code um, that would allow an administrative review of hardscape permit applications for the hardscape that's not permanently affixed to the ground as well as for walkways or patios um, would probably help in allowing that process to happen a little bit easier. It also creates this process for permanent hardscaping found by tying it to Chapter 12. So by tying hardscaping to Chapter 12 explicitly, that is going to um, kind of create that dividing line that anything that's pre-existing that is a permanent structure would have to go through the 
Title IV, Chapter 12 process versus a hardscaping permit process. So that kind of divides that out. And you have before you um, in your packet includes uh, the requirements for, for those to be able to stay. And it requires an evidentiary hearing before the Preservation Commission identifying that A, the item, <clears throat> the structure was in before 1972, and B, that it would be in keeping with the character of the village if it, if it remained. So that's something that's determined by the Preservation Commission, and then they would have to uh, have additional insurance, I believe, is required, as well as um, we would now require also the right-of-way encroachment uh, agreement to make sure that uh, we're not liable for any damage that happens in the right-of-way due to that structure. So you have the ordinance before you that has the changes to both uh, <clears throat> the public ways section as well as the chapter 12 of the building code that talks about the existing structures in the public right of way before you. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And hopefully we can come to some sort of resolution and be able to move forward um, with how to deal with hardscaping in our public right of way. So before we get to questions and uh, discussion, can I have a motion second to approve, please? Motion by Mr. Lumsden. Second. I see you didn't say it this time, and I was watching you. <laughs> <laughs> Second by Mr. Pollock. <laughs> <laughs> so, questions and comments? I think this goes a long way to solve a problem that was a little bit confusing in the past. So, I'm pretty pleased with the verbiage that we put in there. I think it's very clear that we can't build stuff on the public right away. And if there is some really, really good reason for it, we have the opportunity to, to work that direction. Other comments, questions, Mr. Pollock? I just, some clarifications. Um, I corresponded with Jessica and Sonia this week on this, and I got answers to, to most of my questions, but I just wanted to be clear about a couple of things. Uh, on what is page 438, I guess, of the PDF document. Um, it talks about hardscape that is flushed to the ground shall be reviewed and approved or denied by the director of public works or their designee. That includes walkways, patios, stepping stones, in-ground sprinkler systems, etc. And I just want to make sure the staff is comfortable that the public works director, the staff, has adequate standards for approving that. In other words, that when they say no to somebody, they've got something they can point to and say, here's why we're not issuing your permit to pave your whole front yard <laughs> or pave the whole right of way in front of your front yard. Yes, we have um, standards in both our uh, public ways uh, section of the municipal code as well as in the zoning ordinance that kind of uh, determine the size of maximum size, minimum size of different things that you might want to do in your front yard. So we do restrict sidewalks um, on private property to a maximum of five feet in width. We also have that same restriction um, that where a private walk intersects with a public sidewalk. It can't be greater than five feet, but it can be less than five feet, but no less than two and a half feet wide. And um, you can't put it right along the apron to effectively, you know, widen your your driveway apron uh, doesn't allow that. So there's there are uh, restrictions in the code in regards to that. To make that sure would be on private, private property, though. On the yeah. private property, yeah. 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 So then follow up, and I didn't ask this in my emails this week. Okay. Because it, I just noticed this. Number five on that same page says that in all cases where hardscaping is approved, uh, the applicant shall execute a right-of-way encroachment waiver. So do we do that now, and does that mean that if I, right now I have like a three foot wide sidewalk that goes from my front door to the public sidewalk, and I am hoping in the future to replace that, and I might change its location, and I might make it four feet wide. Uh -huh. Would I have to sign a right of way encroachment waiver? Hmm. Should we exclude simple things like we might want to exclude a, a private walk that leads right. to like a front door. We can perhaps exclude that because I don't necessarily know that we need to. Yeah, because I, I, I can't imagine in the past we've required waivers. No, that. we have not. That's been more for like no, the in-ground sprinklers. We've always required, not always, but we have in the past several years required the right-of-way encroachment. 
theater. Yeah. Well, I think the purpose of the waiver is to deal with potential hazardous. I mean, sidewalks are flat, and if it were a hazard, you know, I mean, we would have to, if we didn't have one, the village would then occasionally need to, if they became aware of it, a damaged sidewalk that became a trip hazard would have to notify the property owner that you have a sidewalk that's in our right of way that's creating a potential issue. You need to take care of it. And if we had the waiver, if we had something we could claim, but I don't know that there's a lot of exposure there that would require that. Well, so if it's a simple thing of, of the property owner just signing a document that we have, then maybe it, we leave it and yeah. make people do it. <laughs> if it's if that's all there is to it. Right? Well, we do typically add the recording fee to their permit fee uh, for because it does get recorded at the. I mean, I, I would guess that in no community do you have. I mean, the, the walkway. There are there are walkways that are in the right of way that are not part of the public sidewalk system. There are these right. little, little carriage walks or whatever. And I can't imagine that there are waivers that are signed for people to have those. That seems to be too much. Yeah. Well, it would apply to driveways too, then, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right. Yeah, because those are in our right of way. The right. aprons, yeah. I think those should just be excluded, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. You just add excluding driveways. And or walkways. could we just say, in all cases where hardscape not flush to the ground is approved? In that section five, would that do it? Well, yeah. we, or perhaps earlier on, we can specifically say that driveways and um, service walks from yeah, the I think public that would sidewalk be better would be excluded from being considered hard. Because skin. just saying flat, I mean, the sprinkler systems and so forth, we kind of want it for. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think to call it out that way would be better specifically. Okay. Okay. So they'll handle yeah, that. We, I mean, it, it could be a little tricky because you don't want someone to ask to turf their front yard too or anything like that. So. It's got to be some discretion. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with that, well, we would we would specifically, I think, call out driveway way. aprons, right, walkways, so exactly. That, yeah, yeah. But, but the suggestion was flat and whatever. It's, right, it's I think I'd be more specific than that. I would so recommend that. Yeah. Okay. So you guys can take care of that. Yeah. Okay. The, All right. The other question I have, yes. which. Sonia and I tried to connect today, and I and we missed each other. But uh, on page 439, structures to be removed. I'm having a hard time understanding what that means because the way I read it, it says a structure located in the public right of way adjacent to private property shall be removed from the public right of way upon sale of the adjacent private property or deterioration of the structure, uh, et cetera, unless and unless they get a permit, basically. So that troubles me because that seems to me to say that if we, let's say for example, um, someone, a resident complains that their neighbor has a, a wall that encroaches into the public right of way. And so Sonia goes out and, and investigates, she finds no record of it. You know, no permit ever issued for it. She looks at it, she can't tell, well is this, can't tell if this is brand new don't have any knowledge of when it was built. The owner says, well, I don't know, it's been there forever. What do we do? Does this mean that they can keep it until it's until they sell the property? I think the burden of proof is on the village. Yeah. Right, that's what we were talking about. Yeah, it would really depend upon the nature of the proof that we had and if we felt we had sufficient evidence to prove that it was not pre-existing. If we, we could, then we wouldn't proceed under this provision. We would proceed under the other provision and require immediate removal. But if, if we either thought that the complaint was incorrect or if we felt that there wasn't sufficient proof to warrant if there was a, a disagreement about whether to remove it or not, then the fallback would be this if it was unpermitted. See, that, that, that troubles me because basically what that's saying is that None of this has any meaning because unless we can prove that this was built, it can stay until you sell the property. I think my recollection you know, of our previous discussions were that this was kind of a compromised position. 
This is in the ordinance already. This is not anything new. I mean, but, but the way I read it is that, uh, in fact, I, I read it, if you read it literally, I think the way it reads is that any structure, no matter when it's built, even if we can prove it was built a year ago, this says that you could keep it until you sell the property. And then, when you sell the property, you can keep it if it was built prior to 1972. I get that, that's okay. But I don't understand why we're tying this to the sale of a property. If, if it's not legal, and we find out about it, it needs to be either permitted or removed. So you're questioning item A from the original language. Well, I'm questioning 4-12-2, structures to be removed. It's already in the ordinance. I brought this up at the, la the last time we talked yeah. about this. Because, I, I mean, I, I, I may be having a mental block on reading it, but the way right, I'm reading it. So, yeah, right, it, I mean, the idea is that, say, a year ago, somebody put something in the public right of way. We're saying, this portion of our municipal code would say, okay, you have that in the public right of way. Now granted, this portion was written before we created a hardscape permitting process, I believe. So, but okay, that can stay, but when you go to sell the property, then it needs to come out or you have to provide evidence that it is a historic feature um, and, can, and the Preserva Preservation Commission can determine whether it uh, should remain or not. So that was kind of a process that was built in. Then we have our hardscape permit process that was added in a few years later, I think. Um, so I think our, based on our discussion, the idea was so as not to be overly hard with the hammer that we would default to if we are made aware of a hardscaping feature that's in the public right of way, that we would defer to this section if they did not already have a hardscape permit, that we would defer to this section. And they would say, okay, you can keep it until you go to sell your house, but at that point, it's gonna be removed or you're gonna have to prove that it deserves to stay to the Preservation Commission. I am not comfortable with that. I mean, this is basically getting carte blanche to say that once you put a structure in the right of way, it can stay until you sell your house. I, I, don't, I think 8.813.1, though, is where we're covered. It's not, it could be more elegant, but 8.13.1, if we can prove, that. it's just the two pages before. I mean, if we can prove, it, it clearly says a permit's required. If the village proves that it, it was done without a permit, or that it was, yeah, that it was erected without a permit, illegally, then we can force them to remove it because it says a permit's required. If we can't yeah. prove yeah. that, then 8.412.1 kind of comes into effect. Then so, I mean, if I can go, go ahead, sorry, go ahead. Then 4.12.2 needs to be, to reference that. Reference one, back. Reference back in some way because it, they're, 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 they may be contradictory. Maybe yeah, the, I mean, the way when I looked at it in preparation for the meeting, I, you know, I, I came at it from the standpoint that the law tries to read and interpret statutory or ordinance language so that all of its provisions have meaning. So I guess I was sort of taking that and saying that's where you get to. But I understand what Trustee Pollock is saying. Somebody could hammer on this and say this this doesn't yeah, provide that. I mean. I had a case once where it was a, a, a homeowner, uh, a home occupation ordinance. He had a landscape business, and he was in, in violation of the parking rules involving home businesses, which was you can't have vehicles that are connected with the business that aren't residential vehicles there. Well, he was looking at parking regulations somewhere else in the code. This is I can have up to two cars here, but of course. You can't use, you have to be in compliance with all the regulations because you, your compliance with one doesn't mean it gives you carte blanche to ignore a different one. It was, you know, so it's a similar thing. Somebody would say, well, this means I don't have to have, have a permit. I don't need to take it out. I, okay, I didn't have a permit, but this says I can keep it. Well, I that's think how you'd have to It argue. could be cleaned up. 4.12.2 could say any structure found to have been erected illegally must be immediately removed or something. Well, yeah, I, 
What I would suggest is that 412.2, that, that the word sale of adjacent property be deleted. Because I don't know why we would tie this to the sale of the property. It says, so, so it would read, a structure located in the right-of-way adjacent to private property shall be removed from the public right-of-way. Uh, well, okay, upon notice from the village or deterioration of the structure. What it, but I, I don't know why it's tied to the sale of the property, what that has to do with anything. I think the idea was this is a situation where we can't prove when it was erected and it may qualify under the historic. Angle. Yeah. That's why I was saying the burden of proof is with the village. What you could do, I guess, is say uh, we're where a structure was built in violation of the permit requirement, it needs to be removed immediately. Where a structure where, where no permit is found for a structure in, in the, in the, by the village um, and, and it is not proven to have existed, there's no documentation as to it existing prior to 1972, it can remain until sale when it has to be dealt with. Does that make sense? I, I think I know where you're going and I think you're going the right direction. I think we really got to look at this hard because the way it's written now, I think, a good lawyer would, you know, really wanted to, to find a loophole that could use this. I, well, where, yeah, where this is going to come become an issue is when somebody gets ready to sell a house and they have something that's non-conforming well, and I, it has value in the overall deal and then they, the new people move in and then we go over and they say, hey, by the way, that's got to go, right? That's going to create a really awkward, unneighborly situation, to use our neighborly term that gets criticized, but I, I see that be where, where the where it would come in, right? Or a neighbor complains about something that's been there for we don't know how long. And but then it puts the alternative, the though, is to force them to remove it immediately. So this is more permissive for the homeowner than... Yeah, I, I guess I, I kind of understand where Doug's going with what's it have to do with the sale of the property. It's either proper or not proper. How about, can, I, can I give a sample? See what you think of this? How about if we just said... A structure located in the public public right of way in violation of section 813.1a, adjacent to uh, um, adjacent to private property, shall be removed from the public right of way unless the conditions established in section 412.3 are met. Basically, that's that's what you're getting yeah, at, I think, right? I think so. Mm -hmm. I think so. Is that that would that would remove the middle ground? Mm -hmm. So you would, well, you know, you, you still would have, there's always this situation where you need to prove it was built in the right of way. And to prove something, or prove it was built without a permit, to prove that, you kind of need to prove when it went in. I know, <laughs> if but you I think, can't, if you just, and that's it, but I think, but I think real, I mean, you know, the, the, at some point, it's an evolving village. There's been things yeah. that have been built for decades, century, you know, and so, I think that, that by doing this, we will be able to identify if some, you know, if all of a sudden a wall appears, we'll know that there was no permit issue. And then this would again. If we're talking about something that is that, that extends beyond people's memories, then you've got 412.3. It's I'm sorry, I missed that. You've got 412.3. I mean if you've got if you've got something that's been there for a hundred years. Right. Even though it's encroaching into the public right of way, you've got the argument of 412. They could obtain the permit, and if they don't obtain the permit, then it would have to be removed upon sale. Or are you saying? I, I think when we, we talked have, about this before, we didn't we didn't necessarily want village staff to be visiting, you know, well, 150 properties. Well, that and, was. But see, that was the other the, the other thing I wanted to bring up since we're having this part of the discussion is. If, if something that was allowed under 412.3, so it was built before 1972 and it's been, and the termination has been that it has a, it, it contributes to the historic nature, is the implication that that decision, so, okay, that we're going to allow that to stay. Correct. Does that then run with the land? Is that a one-time thing? Well, it wasn't, I think it was intended to be, it was intended to be a, 
a cutoff where where if somebody where if it was determined that it was built prior to 1972, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that it's not it doesn't have an adverse impact they they can it can be maintained there in perpetuity okay. i mean think think about some of our historic properties if we take if we take the frank lloyd wright home right, right. With the beautiful planters out front there right. i think that we want them to take care of those we want them to put them back into the historic character of that because that's within our mission of our village right so that is something that you certainly wouldn't want to have them tear out of the sale of the property. I and mean, it's kind of saying that we... No, because that would have qualified as, I prior assume... Prior to 72. Yeah. Prior to 72, or they have the permit application process, of which I think there'd probably be a consensus to allow that. But I think that that could easily be established. It was before yeah. 1972. I mean, the concept was to be more permissive, not less permissive. But we're kind of interpreting it different. And the, I think my recollection was this is kind of a way to phase out the problem versus trying to tackle this problem in a weekend yeah yeah you know? okay so now now but, all right so now let, let's let's play, let's use the example of the of the Frank Lloyd Wright mm -hmm. you know the urns okay so um, we have a situation where we have no idea whether their problem wasn't even a permitting procedure correct <laughs> at that point or okay so now word, yeah. so now you have them there mm-hmm what do we expect the homeowner to do about it? Are we asking them to retroactively go back and go th and say, I want, I want to get a permit for something that's been here for I know what I want to years. do. I want to, I want them to keep them in good working order. Right? Make the village look But if they sell yeah. the property. But see, we've taken yeah. that out. We've taken out the wholesale property trigger. So that's what I'm saying. What do we do? I didn't realize this? we took out the sale of the property. But that, that was what was in that's what was in 1412-2, or 412-2 that, that Trustee Pollock didn't like. Then how do we how do we phase out these? That's what I'm getting. Non-complying right. yeah, issues. The, yeah, I think the the way the well, conversation worked before was there was a debate over. The fact, how to deal with the fact that a cutoff had previously been made but wasn't enforced. And so you had encroachments that were post-1972, clearly, but you have no idea when they went in. And you know that it would be a burden on staff to try to get them out. And it and you wouldn't and it'd be a, a, an effort if you had the sue to get them out where you'd have encroachments that might have been put in in 1985. <laughs> and, you know, a court kind of looking at the equities and saying, I don't think I want to make the homeowner remove it when you let it go for 30 years. Uh, it was, and so the way was to sort of create a kind of a tool when people are looking to sell, they're eager to get through the process and they don't like to deal with, you know, it's kind of like collecting money due on property is so much easier to collect when you're not going to give them a transfer stamp unless they deal with the issue than when you're sending bill after bill. And, and it's a time when people are used to like doing quick things and cleaning things up. And so it's a way to, it's maybe a good time to try to pick up those ones that without staff trying to go through and figure that out and send a bunch of letters. I think that's how some of you were thinking at the time. Well, I, if, I think there are, Try to phrase this right. There seems to me there are maybe three ways. The village becomes aware of a structure. So there's it seems to me there's there's you know two things that can happen. They um, they can prove it was built prior to 1972. Then they can get a permit, right? Or they they can apply for a per permit either from staff or through the Historic Preservation Commission. They get that permit. All's good. If they can't get the permit, then they have to prove that it's built prior to 1972. Or that's, an, that's another way of getting the permit. So let's say they can't prove it was built prior to 1972 and, and, and they don't meet the qualifications to get a permit. So now what happens? Um, and it's been then then I would say the language would say, as Trustee Sedvey said, the village needs the burden of proof is on the village, I guess, to show that 
it didn't exist prior, to, that, that it was built after 1972. If it was built after, if the village can't prove it was built after 1972, then they get to keep it till they sell the home. Does that summarize it right, what we want? I think that was the gist of our discussion, not to yeah. say we can't change our mind, but right. I thought that was the gist of our conversation. Uh, if we want to write it that way, I think I'm okay with that, uh, partly because <laughs> we can't always prove. I mean, there, it would be rare circumstance where we can't prove when something was built in that kind of time frame, because you can go to Google Maps and you can see every aerial photograph from almost every year dating back to probably the 50s, right? So you're going to be able to go. I've used this as a tool myself in code enforcement. You can go back and look at those aerials. So, oh, look, here's an aerial from 1980. There's Not no there. walk. There's no wall there. Um, but if we can't prove it, then I'm fine. Uh, then the benefit of the uh, the benefit of the doubt goes with the property owner, and they get to keep it until they sell the home. And, and again, because if if something's built that's a hazard, we can there's stuff up higher that you can have it taken care of. So, so yeah, this would need to, this, these two sections combined would need to be rephrased just to say that uh, structures allowed to remain if it's determined it's prior, built prior to 1972 or otherwise is able to get a permit from the village, meet the qualifications for a permit under 813.1. And then if, if no determination of time is made, then it's allowed to remain until the sale of the property. Grandfather temporarily, basically, at that point. I'm, I'm good Is that, it, it seems like we probably, my suggestion would be that we ask the village attorney to draft that and bring it back to us. <laughs> yeah, I, I was, I was going <laughs> to try to do yeah. something on the spot. But, uh, why, don't we, why don't we do this? Why don't we, why don't we vote on uh, eight thir you know, eight, section eight? Um, and then we'll bring back chapter or chapter 8 and then we'll bring back chapter 12 because I there, there seems to be consensus on on chapter 8 yeah through, it, with regard to hardscape and if we do eight uh, let me suggest if we're going right to passing the ordinance as it's drafted the language would be I think looking at number five yes in all cases where landscape is approved to be installed in the public right-of-way other than carriage walks, sidewalks, and driveway aprons. Does that cover everything? The applicant shall execute. Does that do okay. it? Okay. So um, what do we need? Do we need an amendment yeah. to the motion? To yeah, because the, uh, the motion was to approve. Yeah. So the I, whole. I asked for an amendment to, uh, to approve the ordinance with regard to Chapter 8. 13-1. I move to approve the amendment. By Ms. Collins. Second. Second by Mr. Pollock. Any discussion on that motion? Well, like, first we need, a, we need to pass the amendment. Yeah, we're right. call the roll on the motion to amend first. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Lumsden. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Seventy. Aye. And now call the motion, uh, call the roll on the primary motion. Trustee Collins. Aye. Aye. Trustee Pollard. Aye. Trustee Sunday. Aye. Motion carries, and then we will revisit Chapter 12. We'll get some. Because uh, I think that was a really good discussion. Thank you, Trustee Pollard, for bringing it up. Uh, sure. I don't know where it's at, but I'm sure that there is a place in the code that exempts landmark properties from encroachments on a public right-of-way. That's come up three times that I know of. One is the, uh, the urns that were mentioned earlier. Another one is the wall uh, in front of the house, but the statue of the horse on it. I should know the addresses, but I don't. And the third one is uh, uh, the, the uh, what is that called? The curved uh, colonnade 
that's actually on uh, the right of way. Um, I, are you are you aware of that? Is that of, of that? Are you aware anywhere in the code of the landmark properties being excluded from encroachment violations? Well, they'd be excluded just by the age. Yeah. 1970. I know, but I, but I, I, I don't think I've. Seen well, it's that. it's it's not exactly an exclusion, but it's a permission. Yeah. Well, correct. Because of 1972. Yeah. Correct. We'll we'll look. Because the landmark status, you have the proof you need about right. what. It was I going. know, but but Mr. Ray is suggesting that there's actually something correct. specifically. That. That. Yeah, I think we should be clear. It's not like a historic property can then go erect into the public right away today just because they're a historic property. You're referring to pre-existing encroachments. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah, and I think we're comfortably covered with yeah. that based on the, the the time frame of the encroachment. But I will right. look for any other provision that was missed. So I'll check yeah. for that. So we have no considerations, or is there any new business or anyone? There is no need for an executive session, so I'd ask for a motion and second to adjourn. Motion by Mr. Lumsden. Second. second by Mr. Pollock. Please call the roll. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Lumsden. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Sedeby. <laughs> Aye. Meeting is adjourned. Good night.